Hello, welcome everybody. Happy Earth Week. Um, my name is Cecilia. I use she or pronouns. Um, I'm the CERC Earth Week associate. I'm so honored to have you all here. Um, a little bit about Earth Week. Um, so CERC is the Environmental Resource Center on campus and we kind of cultivate a collaborative space to kind of um, strengthen the collective efforts and effectiveness of the sustainability community. Um, we provide resources for students to actualize their visions um, of a more equitable, socially just and resilient future. Um, we want to affirm our stance at CERC um, as anti-racist and anti-white supremacist organization. Um, we really want our Earth Week to be centered around diversity, inclusion and accessibility by centering voices of color and acknowledging um, that the environment intersects with all identities differently. Um, so this week, this week, Earth Week Associate or Earth Week is a way to navigate um, some amazing opportunities and new spaces, both on and off campus. Um, so I hope you get a chance to um, really look over our calendar and kind of join other events as well this week. Um, this will be recorded and shared onto the Native American Student Development's YouTube channel as well as Cirque's YouTube channel. Um, live audio transcripts are available, and if you'd like to use it. Just go to live transcripts and or more and select subtitle um, or select show subtitle. I will be leading us with the land acknowledgement as well. So um, we recognize that Berkeley sits on the territory of Huchun and of the territory of Huchun, the ancestral and unceded land of the Chochenyo speaking Ohlone people. The successors of the historic and sovereign Verona Band of Alameda County. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Mowekma Olani tribe and the other familial descendants of the Verona Band. We recognize that every member of the Berkeley community has benefited and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the institutions founding in 1868. Consistent with our values of community and diversity, we have a responsibility to acknowledge and make visible the university's relationship to the native peoples. By offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm indigenous sovereignty and we will work to hold the University of California Berkeley more accountable to the needs of the American Indian and indigenous peoples. Thank you for joining me in this land acknowledgement. I will hand it over to Fenosha and um, she will introduce our guest speaker. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Cecilia. Um, and welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm Finosha Bowerly. I am the director for Native American Student Development, and we are so pleased to partner um, on this event. And really, I'm so excited to have Jolie here. Um, Jolie Varela is a citizen excuse me, of the Tule River Yokuts and the Numu Paiute nations. Um, she currently resides in her maternal home, homelands in the Paya Hunaru, um, also known as the Owen Sally. She grew up on the Bishop Indian Reservation, fishing and swimming on the creeks with her cousins. In 2016, Jolie spent almost three months at Osheti Sakawin in solidarity with her relatives at Standing Rock. Inspired <clears throat> by her time at Standing Rock, Jolie returned to Paya Hunaru to bring awareness to, in, to Indigenous issues in her own community. In 2017, she started Indigenous Women Hike. An Indigenous Women Hike aims to regenerate the relationship between the land and its original people, while consequently decolonizing the history of Indigenous territories. And we're, I just feel like we are so lucky to have Jolie here, and I'm really excited to hear her share more about Indigenous Women Hike. and. Um, other issues around surrounding Native um, communities. So with that, I'll hand it over to you, Jolie. Manahobu Fenosha and Manahobu for having me here. I'm really excited to be here with y'all. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. I'm the founder of Indigenous Women Hike, and I want to start off with a content warning. Um, 
In this presentation, I talk about indigenous removal and genocide, the horrific treatment of our black relatives in the so-called United States uh, with some talk of depression, anxiety, um, as well as suicide. So if you're finding it heavy at that moment, I do not take any kind of offense of having to leave the room or um, just to remove yourself, that's totally fine. I understand that these topics can be um, really triggering. So, um, but that is why I put this content warning on here just to let you know that I will be talking about some of these things. And also I want to acknowledge that today, Derek Chauvin was found guilty. Um, I, I want to share a quote by Erica Hart. And that quote says, do not be pacified. This country is still at its core racist and we got work to do. Um, I also want to acknowledge what our Asian, our AAPI relatives are going through in this world right now. And that we all need to be doing our part to be actively anti-racist and um, to dismantle white supremacy. So, thank you. And Manahu Inaniene Jolie Varela, Numunu Payahunaru Yesh Tuli River Nupimaru, Ibia Tony Spoonhunter, Imoa Anita Spoonhunter, Sao Namati Nu. Um, let me just switch this really quickly. There we go. Um, so what I said is, hello, my name is Jolie Varela. I am Numu and Yokuts from Payahunaru or the place of flowing water and also Tuli River. Um, I'm the founder of Indigenous Women Hike and Indigenous Women Hike has really been a healing journey for myself. Um, and, you know, I started Indigenous Women Hike in 2017 after being in solidarity with my relatives at Standing Rock against the Dakota Access Pipeline. And I had come home to Payahunaru. Um, again, Payahunaru means the place of flowing water. It's also known as the Owens Valley, but Richard Owens never stepped foot in this valley. But I came home to my homelands and just knew I wanted to uh, do something in my community. And what I had originally wanted to do was work with indigenous youth and get our youth out hiking and climbing and fishing uh, and doing all of these recreational activities. And I didn't start hiking until my late twenties. Um, I'm 34 years old now. And I probably started hiking around 26 or 27. Um, and it was during a really emotional, depressing time in my life. Um, you know, I, I had just uh, tried to commit suicide and just, you know, if you know about statistics in Native American communities, we have the highest rates of suicide. And I was dealing with a lot of anxiety and depression. And I remember the first solo hike I ever went on was at a place called the Druids. And just the way that I felt afterwards was so amazing and wonderful. And through my connecting to the land and going out hiking and doing a lot of solo hikes and seeing these petroglyphs and seeing these grinding stones, it kind of cemented my connection to this earth, to my homeland. So it, it gave me this sense of identity that I didn't realize that I had had. It made me feel like rooted to my homelands. It, and, and again, it just gave me a sense of who I am. And that was a really healing experience for me. And I wanted our indigenous youth to experience that as well. Uh, but at the time I didn't have the resources to really do that. Um, I knew nothing about nonprofits or, or anything like that. So my decision was that I would just start with myself and I would hike what I knew then as the John Muir Trail. Um, so I started making these videos and I started hiking and uh, getting to a pass or getting to a lake. And I would make a video and talk about how I felt on that hike. 
And, you know, if something was really particularly hard that day, if I was really in my head and feeling like I can't do it, or if I felt really good and I made it to that, that summit or that pass and I was really proud of myself and I would share these thoughts on my Facebook page with my community and this resonated with other women. And so they asked to come with me on my journey and there was just no way that I could say no. And that's how Indigenous Women Hike came to be. And now we're planning our current summer out on the Numupoyo, also known as the John Muir Trail, uh, just connecting. And one of the things that we'll be doing this summer is for our mothers, our uh, indigenous women who work, we'll be going on one to two nighters. So it's more accessible for them to go on these trips and not have to take three weeks off to hike 200 miles. So they'll be able to uh, do one or two nighters and they'll learn the basics of backpacking. And I'm really grateful that I was able to learn that so that I can um, support my community in this way and connecting to our homelands. Um, so on this healing journey, uh, I have somehow become a a body positive advocate. I am a fat indigenous woman and that fat is not a bad word to me. I know that a lot of people's first reaction sometimes is to say, oh, you're not fat. And it's, it's not a negative word for me anymore. Three years ago, I felt very differently about maybe being called fat or anything like that. But there's a whole body positive movement going on and you know, we're not subscribing to Eurocentric body standards anymore. Um, and so that's also been really healing to be in this like fat body positive um, advocate space. And I would also like to acknowledge that as a light skinned indigenous woman, even though I am indigenous, I do still hold privilege uh, because of that, I am afforded access into the outdoor industry or into these spaces with a lot more ease than my darker um, relatives or my black relatives. So that is a privilege that I hold as a light skinned indigenous woman. I want to talk about um, this speaking engagement that I did at so-called Sequoia National Park. And this was really the first time that I had, um, it really clicked with me just how removed um, people think we are from our lands and our homelands and these places that we've always been a part of. And I was invited in 2019 to be a part of a national parks training and to come speak at this training at a uh, so-called Sequoia National Park. And this is the first thing you see when you enter Sequoia National Park. And, you know, this is, you know, a portrayal of what people think indigenous people look like. This is cultural appropriation. This is disrespectful to me. Uh, this is to me a depiction of maybe what a Plains Native American person looks like, um, which a lot of people like to go to that as our default as indigenous people, but we are not a monolith. And there are hundreds and hundreds of uh, federally recognized tribes, but there are also tribes that are not federally recognized. So when I do my introduction, I say that I am a citizen of the, the Numu and Yokuts nations because I wanna be in solidarity with my relatives whose nations are not federally recognized. So I am a citizen of these tribes, um, but to me, when you enter into so-called Sequoia National Park, and this is the first thing that you see, and people are stopping and they're taking pictures with this, and it's just a perpetuating erasure of indigenous people. And this is you know, a caricature of who we are and doesn't represent the indigenous people who um, are on the Sequoia, you know, whose homelands are Sequoia National Park. So this is the first thing I saw as I was entering into this national parks seminar. And 
I spoke with an indigenous person, somebody who is Mono, and they told me about this sign before I went in there. And I asked them, well, would you like me to address this with the people that I'm going to be speaking to. And they gave me that permission. And what this man suggested was that this sign be removed and put up in the visitor center in the museum and uh, with a lesson on why it is cultural appropriation. Uh, it didn't happen, unfortunately, but we were able to address it and hopefully it will be happening in the future because we're not gonna give up on that. So I was in this, seminar and the first day was sitting and listening to a lot of presenters and listening to we were we were there to learn about the wilderness act of 1964 when before you become a parks employee this is something that they all do to learn about the wilderness act and um, it's like basically a training seminar so it was myself and another indigenous woman were in this seminar and we were both going to be speakers but we were invited to the whole event and as we were sitting there you know it was really difficult to listen to each presenter and you know there was a lot of just erasure language going on within this presentation with all of the presenters really and then we get to the meat of what the seminar is supposed to be about, which is the Wilderness Act of 1964. And in the Wilderness Act of 1964, the definition of wilderness is a wilderness in contrast with those areas where man and his works dominate the landscape is hereby recognized as an area where the earth and its community of life are untrammeled by man, where man himself is a visitor who does not remain. So myself and the other indigenous women are sitting in this presentation on the first day and it was really disheartening. And my, you know, the other indigenous woman had to actually get up and leave the room because it was just so triggering the language that was being used, the things that everybody was being taught. Um, so I was able to go to where I was staying that night and revise my presentation so I can come back in and let them know why basically most of the things that they said the day before uh, were really problematic. And so I was able to come through and I was able to talk to them about this definition of wilderness. And here is what I told them. So again, a wilderness in contrast with those areas where man and his works dominate the landscape. Um, that's a very colonial way of thinking of being in connection with the land, this domination. Um, not only that, but is hereby recognized as an area where the earth and its community of life are untrammeled by man, where man himself is a visitor who does not remain. Indigenous people have always been a part of the land. Um, this, defini this definition erases our longstanding history um, and continued connection to the land. Even the places that you think of as the middle of nowhere, uh, indigenous people held those places sacred. And I'm also going to share a story about the time when myself and my really, my best friend Tazba, we went to so-called Death Valley National Park and we brought our traditional tea, which is Tadupi, also known as Mormon tea. And we brought our traditional tea and a jet boil and we sat there on the dunes and we made our tea and we were interacting with the, the other people who were coming to visit those lands. And we ran into a young white couple and we started talking to them. They asked what our tea was, we were telling them and it struck up this conversation and they had told us, oh, well, the kiosk says that uh, the Shoshone people have only been here for a thousand years. And I said, that's absolutely wrong. We are their neighbors from the next valley over. And we know that the Timbasha Shoshone, the Nui have been there for thousands and thousands of years. So it's wrong on the website and it's also wrong on that kiosk. And then he kind of looked around and we're at the dunes. If you imagine what sand dunes looks like and what, if you've been to Death Valley, you can see what it looks like. 
And he said, well, what did they eat? Like, how could you even live here? And I said, tradition or indigenous people have been uh, living and interacting and tending to their homelands for so long that we have this traditional knowledge. You can look at a bush that just looks like a bush to you, but to them, that's a food source. To us, that's a food source. So um, it just, it, it gets really difficult because as I visit national parks um, and go into these visitor centers and ask these workers what they know about the indigenous people of these lands, and in places that are even my homelands, they tell me, oh, well, they didn't come up here because this was too high. There was nothing that they could use here. And this was at the ancient bristle cones. And I said, that is absolutely not true. My people have been coming to this land for thousands of years. We collect tuba, our pine nuts there. It's one of our main food sources. And just encouraging them to get this information correct because they're erasing indigenous people who have always called these places home. Um, so it's really important to do your research beyond a kiosk in a national park, beyond the national parks website, because a lot of the time this information is not correct. Um, so the definition of wilderness from the Wilderness Act of 1964 actually erases our longstanding history with the land. And here I wanted to talk about, excuse me, um, are you using erasure language when talking about indigenous people? And so I know that when I was younger, I would do this unknowingly even to myself, like as an indigenous woman. And so I know that a lot of the times people don't know when they're using erasure language. And we know that language matters. We need to be aware of how we may be unknowingly contributing to the erasure of indigenous peoples. So we still exist, we still interact and care for our homelands. And when you refer to us in the past tense, it erases our current and even future relationship to the land. So think about the ways that you might use erasure language um, when referring to indigenous peoples. And I will show you an example of this. So this is from the US Department of Interior. They not only made this post on Facebook, but they also posted this on Instagram. And let's see if you can spot the erasure language in this post. I'm gonna go ahead and read it. The volcanic tablelands near Bishop, California are a vast, rugged landscape formed over 700,000 years ago by the Long Valley Caldera. In this high desert environment, generations of Paiute Shoshone left behind an extensive collection of carefully chiseled petroglyphs in the rocks. Now a destination for rock climbers, these fragile treasures are protected by the Bureau of Land Management. Okay, so there is to me some pretty heavy erasure language being used in here. And I'm gonna go ahead and first read my response to this post. Uh, I tell them we didn't leave anything behind because we are still here. And the tribe co-manages this area with the Bureau of Land Management. It's also just, or it's also not just a destination area for rock climbers. These are and will always be our sacred homeland. So this specific area is a spot that's very dear to me. We call it Sky Rock. Some other people call it Newspaper Rock. Um, but I visit this place quite regularly. Um, relatives, friends, we visit this place regularly. We pray there. Um, we go to check in on this area to make sure that there's no uh, vandalizing happening and that there's no trash being left so we still care for and interact with these lands and when the department of interior says the paiute shoshone left behind an extensive collection it's saying that we're no longer there um we're still here we still live here there are five tribes in Payahunaru. so when they say left behind it's like we're not here anymore we don't exist anymore not only that, but when they refer to this place as a destination for rock climbers, 
this is way more than just a destination for rock climbers. These are our sacred homelands. They're um, petroglyphs and grinding stones and Tony foundations. And a Tony foundation is, um, it's our house. So a Tony is what we lived in and the foundation, um, you can find them all throughout the gorge where uh, this petroglyph would be found. So, um, Luckily, through this interaction with the Department of Interior and through the great support and followers that I have through Indigenous Women Hike on Instagram, we were able to get the Department of Interior to change this post and to think about how they are unknowingly using erasure language. And we still catch them in the act every once in a while doing it. Um, but I, once it's usually pointed out, they will change it. Um, but it's just really important to think about how we are talking about indigenous people and how we are talking about these places because we are still here. We interact with our homelands. Uh, we visit our sacred places. And um, you know, when posts like this go up or people say things like this, it erases all of our people. So it's really important to think about how you are using erasure language and maybe how you didn't even know that you were. And here we have good old John Muir. And something that I like to say about JM is that JM quotes are like the live, laugh, love of the conservation world. Um, and this is a quote, a strangely dirty and irregular life, these dark eyed, dark haired, half happy savages lead in this clean wilderness. Um, so a common misconception here in the Pamiru Toyobi, also known as the Sierra Nevada, is that John Muir went out with a loaf of bread and traveled our homelands. And he just got around in that way. When I know from an elder who is a mentor to me, my good friend, Kathy Bancroft, um, who let me know that her elders told her that JM would either trade with indigenous people in the mountains or often steal from them. Um, so this idea that he just grabbed a loaf of bread and went up into the mountains and created these trails is completely false. John Muir, I don't even like to say his name, so I refer to him as JM, followed our ancestral trade routes. These trails were already there. Um, you know, they were created not only by Numu people, but by Yokuts, by Miwok, uh, by Kudzitika, by the many tribes that call the Pamiru Toyobi home. And so this idea that JM created these trails erases our history. People think that we lived here for thousands and thousands of years and actually didn't travel across the mountains and trade, um, which is a really ridiculous thought if we really sit here and think about it. You don't even have to really sit there and think about it. It's just ridiculous. Um, and so, you know, there's this whole trail that's a wor world famous trail that goes through our homelands that bears this man's name when that's only a recent history, when there's thousands and thousands of history prior to that. Um, and we need to acknowledge that and we need to honor place names and, and we need to be talking about um, the things that people don't know that JM did say and how that was violent and how because he uh, is one of the founders of Sierra Club that really uh, National Parks was founded on that racism and is still perpetuated in the world today. So one of the things people like to argue a lot about you know, well, I've heard in meetings at Sierra Club that, well, I don't think Native Americans traveled from North to South in the Pamiru Toyobi. And these are white men in these situations where I'm at a Sierra Club meeting, you know, talking to them. And I'm like, that's absolutely what, like, that's absolutely untrue. And John Muir in his writing will tell you himself if you, if you, read closely. And this word is uh, blanked out because I will not say it because it is a derogatory term used to um, to talk about indigenous women and 
uh, please don't ask me. You can Google and search and find out what that word is. Um, but it says the blank carry immense loads on their backs across the rough passes and down the range, making journeys of about 40 to 50 miles each way. And this is from JM himself in my first summer in the Sierra. So he tells you himself about going and being amazed by these women carrying these loads this far. Um, and then I will also tell a story of, um, you know, our people were forcibly marched to Fort Tejon in 1862 and 1863. And we, two young women who are relatives of my good friend, Charlotte Lang, who is the Kudzidika chairwoman, um, two of her relatives who were young girls at the time escaped Fort Tejon and traveled through the Palmito Toyobi to get home. They didn't have Patagonia jackets or North Face shoes or any of that. They just had their ancestral knowledge and they knew those lands. And so they made it home um, from Fort to home, they escaped and they made it home uh, with the knowledge of their ancestral trails. So-called public lands hold the creation stories, burial grounds, ceremonies, traditional foods, traditions, et cetera, of indigenous peoples who were removed and murdered to designate them as such. So how national parks, these, these are the first national parks that were created. In 1862 and 1863, I just said that our people were forcibly marched to Fort Tejon. So 10 years later, the, the first national park was uh, created, Yellowstone National Park in 1872. Um, during that same time was the Modoc War. And this was caused by a policy that insisted that the Modocs be deported from California to a reservation uh, in Oregon, to a Klamath reservation in Oregon. Then we have Sequoia and Kings National Park, Yosemite National Park, uh, Mount Rainier, Crater Lake, all of these in the 1890s, early 1900s. Um, and during, during that time, Southern states were passing laws designed to keep Black people from voting. Uh, there were the, the segregation laws, the Jim Crow laws that were happening all during this time. And then, you know, finally, in 1924, Congress granted citizenship to all Native people born in the so-called United States. But even after Native people, even after the Indian Citizenship Act, some Natives still weren't granted um, the right to vote because that was governed by state law. And the reason why I'm sharing this is because national parks are considered America's greatest idea. And there's this thought that's put out into the world that uh, these lands were put aside for all of us. They were created with us in mind. Um, but if you look at the history that was happening while these parks were being created, they weren't created for us. They weren't created for black people um, to visit. They weren't created for indigenous people to visit because we were being removed and murdered to designate these places as public land. Um, so just know like these not like this is why you know brown people black people still can feel unsafe going into these places and going into national parks um, because they really weren't created for us and even conservation can be a very uh, 
racist space when you think about Sierra Club and you think about how Death Valley National Park was created um, they were trying to remove the Timbasha Shoshone people from those lands and Sierra Club was supporting that removal of those people um, right now and again uh, JM was one of the founders of the Sierra Club right now um, what's going on at Thacker Pass near McDermott with our um, relatives up there is the, the proposed lithium mining. Sierra Club is also supporting that lithium mining that's happening there that would devastate those lands um, that are sacred to our indigenous relatives in Nevada, so-called Nevada, excuse me. Um, so just to be really aware how like we think of these environmental organizations um, and there's still a lot of racism that occurs within them and I will actually be having a meeting with Sierra Club um, on Thursday to talk about some of these things and to have them be addressed because um, if you're not aware in last year Sierra Club came out with a article talking about their racist beginnings and addressing JM's, uh, the things that JM had said and how he was in fact a racist. And um, we wanna hold them to that. Like it's not enough to just address that. What are you going to do moving on to make it right and to be in solidarity with indigenous people? It's like when somebody does a land acknowledgement, right? There needs to be action behind that land acknowledgement. We don't want an empty land acknowledgement. We want action. So we continue to travel our ancestral trade routes as an act of reclamation of not only our sacred lands, but also the sacred spaces inside of ourselves. Um, Indigenous Women Hike has become ceremony and I get really emotional when I talk about this. Um, I was able to, to speak to with some relatives during the pandemic and I was talking about Indigenous Women Hike and um, you know, how we just hope to continue traveling our ancestral lands and being in community with one another. And um, it's, it's difficult. It's difficult to be on the trail for 22 days uh, for almost 200 miles and to get out of your, your comfort and to push your body and um, to, to be in community and live closely with one another like that while you're on the trail. Um, and that's part of the ceremony. And when we travel, we travel under the American Indian Religious Freedom Act. So we go without permits because we don't need a permit that allows us to travel our own homelands. Um, and, you know, these are some wonderful women that have joined me in the past. This summer we'll be going to, uh, we'll be summiting to Mangaya twice, also known as Mount Whitney. And I really just love the work that I've been able to do with Indigenous Women Hike. And, um, you know, with the first year, something like being in the outdoor industry is just a really weird place to find myself. But through my work with Indigenous Women Hike, I've been invited into certain places. And I'm always sure to say that the outdoor industry profits from the removal and genocide of Indigenous people. This is like, I can't remember if it's like $800 billion um, that is the outdoor industry. And so I believe that they owe reparations to indigenous people um, for profiting off our homelands that we were removed from. So we are able to um, get packs and trekking poles and all of these things donated, um, but not even, I wouldn't even call it a donation. The, the uh, companies that we go through know that this is not a donation, this is reparations, this is what they should be doing. Um, so this is our crew from two summers ago now. My Yokut sisters here, my Numu sisters here. Um, and I am Numu from Payahunaru. I'm not Owens Valley Paiute. I do not recognize names forced upon my people by colonizers or the so-called United States government. So um, Paiute is 
uh, a name given to us by the United States government, but I am Numu and Numu means the people. And so I, I rarely ever refer to myself as Owns Valley Paiute or I'll say Numu uh, or Paiute because a lot of people still don't know what Numu is. So I think that it's important wherever we go to honor indigenous place names. And this can look like when you're traveling, you do a Google search and you say indigenous people of wherever you are, and you can find a cultural center, you can find information and you can do your research while, while traveling. A lot of people like to use the native land app. Um, it's not something that I like to use, uh, honestly, because a lot of the information on there is wrong. Uh, so that's a good place to start, but always go beyond that and do a Google search. You learn more that way. Um, and you're able to find places like cultural centers and maybe even place names. So when you're doing your search, find out who the first people are and uh, maybe if you're going there and if you're hiking or climbing, are there places that you shouldn't be at? Are there places that you shouldn't take pictures of? Um, and a good way to find that out is usually by visiting a cultural center or even calling ahead, but also be aware that if indigenous people don't wanna tell you this information, they don't have to. Some of us are still really protective over these things and that's fine. Um, so honoring indigenous place names. I'm gonna tell you a couple of names here. So this is, Tumen Gaia, also known as Mount Whitney, highest to be or how, highest mountain in the lower 48. Tumen Gaia is a Shoshone word. It means very old man. So very old man in Shoshone, um, but different nations will have different names for this. And what I was told by an elder is, uh, the mountain looks different from different places. So where the Shoshone were at, he looked like a very old man. So that's why they named him Tumangaya. And you know, there will be other names for that mountain in other languages. There's also the Pamiru Toyobi, also known as the Sierra Nevada. That's a Numu word. Numu Poyo, which means the people's road or the people's trail, also known as the John Muir Trail. Tovangar also known as Los Angeles, and that is the Tongva name for so-called Los Angeles. Kuyui Pa Panunaru, AKA Pyramid Lake, which is our Northern Paiute relatives way of um, addressing their homelands or their lake. And uh, I'm not sure, I think I might be going a little over on time here, but this is, the Payahunaru Gear Library. And this is a library that I created for all of Payahunaru. Um, anybody, non-Indigenous, whoever can borrow filters, Garmin devices, packs, tents, sleeping pads, anything. And this is free for our whole community to, because um, cost of gear is one of the barriers to accessing the outdoors. Um, and how, how much time do we have? Are we close to, I'm trying to see if I should share this video or not. Um, maybe I'll just end with my song and then we'll go into some questions. And I'll let you know that if you wanted to watch this video that I was about to share, um, you can go to YouTube and look up Indigenous Woman Hike. This is a lovely video made by Matika Wilbur, who actually came in and hiked in one of our resupplies in 2018 and made this video for us. Um, and I wanted to kind of end by telling you a story and uh, singing a song that goes with that story. So as we traveled the Numupoyo, myself and my other six, uh, indigenous sisters, um, you know, we, we came across these places and <laughs> these names like the derogatory name for an indigenous woman, Lake, and you know, all of our, all of these places were named after um, JM and other colonizers. And we found ourselves going over this pass, also known as Glen Pass, and we renamed it Mia Tijue. 
And that means keep on going because it's one of the hardest passes on the Numu Poyo. And we were just going up and up and up and it was very, uh, it was very hard. So we kept on telling ourselves, keep on going. But we started to catch a song and we started to hear a song. And so we made this song and I want to invite anyone who identifies as an indigenous woman. This song is for you to sing when you're on the trail. Um, and, you know, I want to share it with you. So this song, um, you know, it says Numupoyo Way. So that's on the people's road we're going. Huhupio Hobu Toyobio Way, very strong women to the mountains. Um, Sao Nama, Sao Sunik, Sao Mia Tiju. It's uh, strong thoughts, strong feelings keep on going. Uh, Tebia Tubipu Mana Hobu. And it's our Mother Earth, thank you. So I'm going to go ahead and end this and then we'll move on to questions. But I'm going to sing this song and then we'll go from there. No mu poyo way, hu o hobu toyo bi away. Sao nama sao sunik sao mia tiju. Te bia tu bipu mana hobu. No mu poyo way, hu hupi o hobu toyo bi away. Sao nama sao sunik sao mia tiju. Te bia tu bipu mana hobu. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Jolie. That was really lovely. Um, and, and I always just appreciate all of the knowledge that you share with us. Um, at this point, we are going to open it up for questions and answers. Um, at the bottom of your screen, you can click reactions. And if you click your raise your hand, I'm going to be monitoring and we'll try and call on folks as I see them. Well, Julie, I don't see any questions as of yet. So I think um, if you don't mind just giving us I mean, you gave us so much information there, uh, and I really, really appreciate it. But maybe can you talk a little bit more um, about the book since we just raffled it off and what your your work on on that? Yes. Okay. So I was approached. I was asked to write a foreword for this book, "The Best and the Worst of John Muir." And I was really intrigued. I mean, I don't want to put my name on something that is going to be praising JM. Um, that's really important to me. Um, but knowing that it's going to tell the other part of the story is really important to me. So knowing that I was able to write this forward um, and kind of let people know about the indigenous history of that very famous trail was really important to me. It was the first forward that I've ever written and hopefully soon I will be writing a book myself, um, which is very exciting. But I'm, I'm excited to read this book and to receive my own copy and to see um, what else is shared because there are a lot of works that people haven't read of JM um, that are, you know, pretty problematic and people need to know about this part of history too and stop glorifying John Muir. Thank you, I'm struggling unmuting myself. Um, <laughs> thank you for that. Well, if folks have questions, please again, feel free to raise your hand um, while we're waiting for that. Maybe jo Jolie, can you just, I do have another question, but can you just tell us a little bit about the book that you were going to write yourself? Yeah, so I've been approached by Heyday, which is the publisher for the book that we're talking about, and then Penguin, and then another um, publisher to write a book. I haven't, um, I'm more 
thinking of the idea and thinking that it's something that I want to do. Um, and it would just be about, for me, my healing journey on the Numupoyo and how really uh, connecting to these lands really is something that saved my life and uh, helped me feel rooted in my identity as an Indigenous woman. And so that's something that I would really like to share with people. I feel really grateful that, um, you know, somebody thinks that my voice is powerful enough to share for a book that feels awesome to me and also really overwhelming. Uh, because with Indigenous Women Hike, y'all can follow the Instagram. Um, and there's there's so much more work than just on the Instagram. The, the Instagram has become kind of like a happy side effect. Um, I had no idea that it would get to the size that it is and that I would be able to provide uh, or help support the community with it. Um, but and, and through that, people have seen the work that, you know, we're doing with Indigenous Women Hike. And that's how some, how some of these book offers have come in. So it's really, it's really exciting. Awesome, thank you. I'm excited for that as well. Um, I think you have covered a whole lot, and, but one of the things that you were very intentional about in the early in the, the presentation was, um, making sure that you covered both what was going on with the creation, with the um, removal of Native people, or in some cases, the murder of Indigenous people to open up the land for um, the real people of this country, as um, some might have thought of it at that time. But you were very intentional about also showing or, or lifting up that what was going on for um, the African-American or Black community in this country at the same time. And I think that was a great, uh, that's a great way to be in solidarity. But I, I also have a question about um, why do you think it's important for uh, in, in Earth Week or, you know, Earth Day and in this Earth Week celebration to really make visible those communities in particular in, in relation to environmental, environmentalism and outdoors, um, like thinking about conservation, et cetera. And if that question doesn't make sense, let me know because I just stumbled on a bunch of words, so. No problem. I will try to answer that question the best I can. Uh, it's important to be in solidarity with our black relatives, not just in the conservation world, but with everything that's going on right now. But also black people do not feel safe out in national parks or in the so-called wilderness. Um, and, you know, there needs to be uh, indigenous solidarity because a lot of our communities, because of colonialism, um, there, are an there is anti-blackness in our communities as native people. Like just because we're indigenous doesn't mean that we cannot be anti-black. Um, that's just not true. So it's important for us, not only just in the conservation world, but just in everyday, of, like our everyday lives to talk to our relatives about this and um, to let them know that like, you know, if, if we're anti-black, then we're pretty much like that's, that's, it's like being anti-Indigenous too, because our, people always say this, is our liberation is bound to one another. You know, once things are set right for the Black community and Black people, um, then all of our lives are going to get better and we're all going to benefit. And I would also say like, for what has been happening with uh, statues of Columbus coming down, names being renamed, that could not happen without the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, you know, a lot of work, of course, went into that, but are into standing against these and trying to get names changed and all of this, but it was really, uh, you know, with the Black Lives Matter movement that this was able to happen. So I think that it's really important that we be in solidarity with one another and speak up about 
um, the anti-blackness that happens not just within the conservation world or in the outdoor industry, but really everywhere. Because, um, you know, once black people are treated justly in how they're so like how they should be treated, then we're all going to be treated fairly as well. And then I just also would like to acknowledge that black and indigenous people do exist you know, and um, that we need to be listening to their voices as well and uh, inviting them into all spaces and just all Black people really. So um, thank you for asking me that question. I hope that I answered it uh, okay. Absolutely. I mean, it, I was also asking what you thought, so there's no wrong answer to what you think, right? Um, I think maybe there seem to be no other questions from the um, participants. So I guess in a closing question before we do the next raffle, my question would be, um, oh, sorry, somebody put in a, there's a, it, it, Andrea Salazar added something in the um, chat for folks to, uh, about some other hiking collectives that have been useful. Um, so folks can check that out. But I think my last question to you would be, if you could, if people attending this had one takeaway from all of the information you just dropped on us and the perspective, what would you hope would be the takeaway from people who attended this session in the very deep and thoughtful work that you're doing and you're involved with? To support indigenous people and ind indigenous organizations doing this work. Um, I know I said a lot of heavy things in this presentation, but there's also a lot of really good things happening in our communities. There's food sovereignty programs. Um, there are these outdoor programs happening. There are gear libraries popping up in indigenous communities. Um, and we, we are thriving. We're, you know, we are, we are thriving in our communities. There's still a lot of language that needs to be remembered. There's ceremonies that need to be remembered. I don't like to say that anything is lost. Um, I, I just like to say that we need to remember these things. And because of colonialism, it could feel like uh, a lot of our languages and ceremonies have been lost, but I believe that we just need to remember them. And, and through hiking and connecting ourselves to our ancestral lands, and you don't even necessarily have to go on a hike. You can, you can just go stand outside because everywhere you are is indigenous land. Um, so also just knowing like to support these indigenous communities, support land back, um, just support the people who are on the front lines and doing this work and to know where you are and to do that research and to uplift those voices. Uh, no empty land acknowledgements. Um, if you are a white person who has generational wealth and um, who has privilege, release some of that privilege, give reparations to black folks, to indigenous folks, um, give up your generational wealth. And um, I think that's it. Thank you. I, I think that's a great list of takeaways. And I really love that sentiment um, that things are not, I'm, I'm with you, that things are not lost. Um, an elder once was I was talking with said, you know, they're not lost, they're just waiting to be remembered. And um, I, I that sentiment um, really resonates with me. So thank you, Jolie, and really appreciate everything. Um, Want to turn it over to Cecilia now to do the other two raffles. And then maybe we can give some appreciation again to Jolie before we wrap up. Thanks for coming. Thank you for coming. And um, Jolie, thank you so much for sharing with us. And I want to send everybody off with appreciations and hope that you have a good rest of your week and a great Earth Week. See you. Take care, everyone. Thanks for coming. Thank you all. Manahobu. Bye, Jolie. Thank you so much.